time for some more XKCD. Specifically, what if a glass of water were literally half empty? That imply it's also literally half full. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This question comes from Vittorio, who asks, what if a glass of water was, all of a sudden, literally half Oh, a vacuum. The pessimist is probably more right about how it would turn out than the optimist. <laughs> When people say glass half empty, they usually mean a glass containing equal parts water and air. Mm. Traditionally, the optimist sees the glass as half full, while the pessimist sees it as half empty. Linguist Gretchen McCulloch points out that we choose which reference state dimension as a way to efficient- Well, how an engineer typically looks at this question would be, it's both half empty and half full. Though, if you'd add in caveats like at standard atmospheric pressure, it could flash to steam if we change the pressure, like putting a vacuum on top as they're suggesting, that sort of thing indicate whether the glass is currently being filled or emptied. Language is cool. But what if the empty half of the glass were actually empty? A vacuum. Yeah, it's gonna boil. <laughs> There's no air pocket above it to keep it a liquid, so you're gonna have an explosive hydraulic transient. The vacuum would definitely not last long, but exactly what happens depends on a key question that nobody usually bothers to ask. Which half is empty? Yes. <laughs> I love this channel. Either way, that glass won't be there for long. For our scenario, we'll imagine three different half-empty glasses. The traditional air-water glass, a vacuum on top glass, and a vacuum on bottom glass. We'll imagine the vacuums appear at time t equals zero. For the first handful of microseconds, nothing happens. On this time scale, even the air molecules are nearly stationary. Sure, yeah, if we're talking microseconds, I buy that. For the most part, air molecules jiggle around at speeds of a few hundred meters per second, but at any given time, some of them happen to be moving faster than others. The fastest few are moving at over a thousand meters per second. These are the first few to drift into the vacuum in the glass on the left. The vacuum on the right is surrounded by barriers, so the air molecules can't easily get in. The water, being a liquid, doesn't expand to fill the vacuum in the same way that air does. However, in a vacuum, it does start to boil, slowly shedding water vapor into the empty space. So in a pressurized water reactor, the reactor coolant doesn't boil. Or rather, it's not supposed to. One key parameter that is looked at there is the departure from nucleate boiling ratio. Average pressure is 2250 PSI in a pressurized water reactor, and average temperature is about 590 degrees Fahrenheit. So the water is still a liquid. A very hot liquid, but a liquid. Now, nucleate boiling, where a little bubble forms and then just moves away is normal. It's the healthy boiling for a non-boiling water reactor. It enhances heat transfer. It's right in the sweet spot for heat transfer to be most effective. What this DNBR looks at is how close the system is from moving away from this safe nucleate boiling to the more dangerous film boiling where a thin layer of steam forms within the reactor coolant system and it just doesn't cool as well because steam is not nearly as good of a heat conductor as water. So if this DNBR gets too low, the reactor core could overheat, causing all kinds of safety issues. And really all it means is keep your pressure and temperature in a safe band. And if it deviates too much and you have a temperature or pressure transient that the reactor operators can't recover from on their own, then there's several automatic reactor trip functions that safely shut down the reactor, making DNBR not a concern. I like that on the time scale here, we're still not even aware that it's been swapped out with vacuum yet at point zero 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 two seconds. The water on the surface of the left glass also starts to boil, but the incoming air will stop it before it really gets going. After a few hundred microseconds, the air rushing into the glass on the left fills the vacuum completely and rams into the surface of the water, sending a pressure wave through the liquid. Yep. The sides of the glass bulge slightly, but they contain the pressure and don't break. The okay. shock wave reverberates through the water and back into the air, joining the turbulence already there. The shock wave from the vacuum collapse takes around a millisecond to spread out through the other two glasses, which both flex slightly as the wave passes through them. In a few more milliseconds, the Okay, so they're all right next to each other. Okay, I, I thought we were talking three isolated scenarios. Shockwave reaches the human's ears as a loud bang. Around this time, the glass on the right starts to visibly lift into the air. The air pressure around the glass is trying to squeeze the glass and water together. 
This effect is easy to imagine with a wine glass. Air pressure at sea level is around 15 pounds per square inch. So in a typical glass, the water's surface and the glass below it are being pushed down yes. with a force of almost exactly 100 pounds. Normally, this force is opposed by the air pushing up. One way of looking at a sudden vacuum, it would be negative 15 pounds per square inch relative to the atmosphere. So it's just going the other way. On the bottom of the glass. But in the glass on the right, air pressure pushes the glass up from below unopposed with 100 pounds of force while simultaneously pushing the water down from above. This is the force we think of as suction. Yep. The vacuum on the left didn't last long enough for the suction to noticeably lift the glass. But since air can't get into the vacuum on the right, the glass and the water begin to slide toward each other. By now, the boiling water has filled the vacuum with a very small amount of water vapor. However, the glass and the water are moving too fast for the vapor buildup to matter. Less than 10 milliseconds after the clock started, they're flying toward each other at several meters per second. Without a cushion of air between them, just a few wisps of water vapor, the water smacks water. into the bottom of the glass like a hammer. Water is very nearly incompressible, so the impact isn't spread out over time. It comes as a single sharp shock. The momentary force on the glass is immense, and it breaks. Yeah. This water hammer effect, which is responsible for the clunk you sometimes hear in old plumbing when you turn off the faucet, can also be seen in the well-known party trick of smacking the top of a glass bottle to blow out the bottom. Water hammer is a key principle that you prepare for in nuclear power plants. Uh, anytime you start up a large system, like the reactor coolant system, for instance, that's especially since it's designed to operate at 2250 PSI, need to ensure you do a good fill and vent so you don't have little pockets of pressure that can cause hydraulic transients like this. I've never seen one with the reactor coolant system, but I've seen ones in the turbine building, the non-nuclear part of the plant, where large pipes a few feet in diameter jumped. It's loud, and lights in the building were shattered. It's, it's crazy. Nobody was injured in this case, but there's definitely um, high potential there, which is one of the reasons why there's always plan announcement safety briefings whenever you start up a large system. In our situation, the forces would be more than enough to destroy even the heaviest drinking glasses. Fun fact, when I- so I guess I was wrong about the first one. I guess just the forces were low enough in terms of magnitude for a mere glass of water. I guess I'm just so used to dealing with bigger vessels. I was trying to calculate this. I bought a bunch of cheap glasses from the dollar store and then tested, you know, applying different amounts of force to the base of them to see how easy they were to blow Side out. Effect. One of the glasses just didn't break no matter what I did, so I kept it. It sits on my shelf. It doesn't match any of my other glasses, which kind of annoys me. And every time I look at it, I think like, what? thanks, science. So this is why I stick to theory. The bottom is carried downward by the water and thunks against the table. The water splashes around it, spraying droplets and glass shards in all directions. Meanwhile, the detached upper yeah, portion of the glass effect. continues to rise. After half a second, the observers, hearing a pop, have begun to flinch. Their heads might lift involuntarily to follow the rising movement of the glass. The glass has just enough speed to bang into the ceiling, breaking into fragments, which then return to the table. The lesson? If the optimist says the glass is half full, and the pessimist says the glass is half empty, the physicist shucks. <laughs> very well said. I always appreciate these little questions. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.